I want to tell you the story of Lisa Cox, and she's one of our community health champions in Sheffield. And um, Lisa taught, tells this story many times, so I'm okay to tell her to share the story. Um, she um, was abused as a child and um, then went on to develop mental health problems, was self-harming for lots of years, was registered with a GP, fantastic GP, who put her on a, a counselling waiting list. Um, GP saw almost any, every other day um, in and out of accident and emergency throughout the year. Lisa and I calculated it probably cost the NHS about £8,000 a year, um, but actually was doing nothing to support what, what was happening for Lisa in her life. Um, she, she, we, she became part of a programme that we run in Sheffield to be um, a community health champion. And what that did for it was it gave her some more confidence and some knowledge and some awareness around her health and well-being and the health and well-being of other people in her community. And she started to volunteer in a, in a health champion role in Sheffield, working a lot with um, um, older people's groups. Um, so she did things like she learned to drive a minibus, she did chair-based exercise with older people, she took them swimming. Um, or accompanied them to swimming. She set up a group for, for other young women who had um, mental health issues. And um, she eventually got a telephone call from the counselling service to say that her, you know, there was a place. She said she didn't need it. She was doing really well. And if anybody was on their waiting list, they could come to her group. And I think what that shows is what Lisa did for herself and what Lisa did for other people. Um, but what she also did was she discovered a voice and she became confident and she tells this story everywhere and um, we won the Prime Minister's Big Society Award which is a bit of a poison chalice really because um, as soon you know this is not about being told to, to volunteer. Anyway we went to Downing Street to get our award and um, sort of the camera and said well done all together better heard everything about you walked off didn't listen to us, didn't speak to Lisa, didn't, so she, she, um, she stalked him really, um, worked out where he was going to leave and she caught him before he left the room and she said, um, you know, I just need two minutes to tell you my story and she told him a story and um, part of the story is what I've told, I've shared with you. Um, the other part of it was after a thousand hours of volunteering, she was then able to get a job um, so she's now working full time. Um, she isn't costing the state any money, so sixteen and a half thousand pounds we calculated. If you're no longer on benefits, housing benefits, she's paying tax. Um, so that was an added dimension. Um, but all of that, that, they're the sorts of stories we have to tell the system to convince the system that this is worth it. I mean, what? What's important to me is that Lisa's happy now. Lisa's got a life. Lisa's going to get married next year. She's amazing. And she's one of 17,000 people. And so the benefits of this are huge. Um, we count up how many people Lisa impacts on and we get to more than 500 people with the things that she does. She, um, I mean, she's broke, really. She's in a sort of a fairly low-paid job now. Um, but she's given up some of her hours so she can continue her volunteering. Because she says, what I get out of it is twice as much as I put in. Yeah. So it just totally transforms her life. Um, it's transformed it in other ways. She's um, looking after a child with cerebral palsy in her spare time because she's now confident enough to do that. Um, and every time I meet Lisa, I hear a bit more of the story. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, so that's Lisa's story. Um, another story is around trying to, to use the lessons that we've learned from this work and to work out how it fits with the system and how people might be involved in core governance. So um, we've invited people who live or are in a GP practice and in the local community to become practice health champions. So we say, do you want to improve the health and well-being of people in your area? That's the offer. They come along, they do two days of work with us. Um, they do develop some confidence. They realise they've got assets, they've got qualities and skills, they've got things they can share. They know their community in a way their practice don't know their community. Um, and then what they do is they, um, 
find ways to work together so they co-produce, they practice and the champions sit down together, say what are our issues, what do we want to work on, um, and they decide how they're going to do things. Um, I went out to a practice a couple of weeks ago, uh, new health champions, and is it possible to have some water? Yes. I'm really dry. Um, so uh, we recruited 20 health champions and um, two days training, only their second support session. We worked with them for a year afterwards, after the training. And it's about creating the conditions, it's about creating an environment and helping to motivate, inspire them, build their confidence. After the second session, they went round the room and they said what they were... Thanks. Okay, um, so they went around the room and they said what they were going to do. Somebody was going to set up an incontinence group. Somebody else was going to set up a, a group for young mums because there was nothing in her area and she had to lie about where she lived if she wanted to go to a young mums group in a local area. Somebody else was going to set up a COPD group. Um, a group of people wanted to work together to set up a group <coughs> for people who were not in paid work. So that they, but there was about 10 of us around the room. So our next idea was, if we did this in every practice in a CCG area, CCG area, we're talking about 44 practices in each CCG area. If only half of those people were recruited, that's 440 people. So 440 people <coughs> become a, a, a strong voice for change. And it's about democratising health. It's about giving control back to people around the decisions that are made. And the, the GPs, interestingly, they don't want to make the decisions about health and well-being in the places that I'm working, because they know they're going to be on popular decommissioned decisions. But the people I work with, they live on a budget, tight budget, so they know, you know, little amount of money. They have choices to be made. They're really responsible about those sorts of conversations. Um, so we're sharing this now with the NHS Commission Board, who the guy that we're talking to is interested because he knows that things have got to change radically. The bit that I really struggle with is that the NHS Commission Board is command and control. David Nicholson will run it in that way, and that's, you know, we're talking about not citizens, but consumers. So how this will work inside the Commission Board, but we're going to try. And in having those conversations with the Commission Board, we won't have them without having diverse voice. So it's citizens, it's GPs, it's people in communities, it's practices, it's... Um, everybody who should be involved in the conversation so that we stop having the same conversation, so that we have a different conversation because of diversity of voice. And every time that happens, we, something different comes out of it. And I guess they're, they're just the principles around co-production. But actually, it's making different things happen. We're aware of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.